yeah, I know I've uh, emailed you for years, but I haven't been able to talk to you too much on the phone and stuff. So it's good to good to hop on a podcast with you. Yeah, I always I put my cursor over your name on your email and your e bat e twelve or something. I mean, you I've had your email for a lot of years. Yeah, it's it's been I don't know how many years, but I I I always keep everybody's email. If they send me an email and ask me a question, I always save their email and you, and then I kind of mark them according to how old they were. Yours is pretty old. Yeah, I think I think the first time I got into scent lock, well, the first year I really started hunting was twenty twenty. Um, but before that, like my parents are from England, so I didn't grow up hunting. Um, it was something that I kind of just like got introduced with some local friends that did it um and it just became something that I loved and my dad's a big gun guy but he didn't he didn't hunt and I got into it and then I started watching a lot of your stuff and uh I just was like I'm not seeing any deer why and I know that there's not a whole lot of deer in New Hampshire population wise especially where I live but I was like I there's got to be something I'm doing wrong so I started hunting scrapes, bedding areas, and using scent lock. And last year I saw 18 bucks. And majority of the people I know rarely see a buck if they ever do. So <laughs> I love it. <laughs> and I, I I killed five deer with my bow that one year, the first year that I started um, yeah. doing scent lock. Um, and then I got like the the tub, got all that stuff. I don't have like a scent blocker thing because I'm poor college student but... oh i i don't use those anyway don't buy one of those those no. so i just i just had the tub like you um but oh. i wish i had one of those element cars those are nice for if you want to get changed in the back of them or like your minivan yeah. uh but i i drive an old corolla so the deer's barely deer barely fit in the back of my trunk <laughs> hey at least it's a toyota you don't have any issues with it probably exactly <laughs> no, it, it'll go forever it still it? runs great no, yeah, it it uh it works. It just looks sketchy, and I need to use something else so people don't call the cops. Oh, someone's hunting because in oh, okay. if, oh, if that's right. You're in the posted, if it's yep. not posted, um, you can hunt it. So that's like the rule in New Hampshire. So there is sometimes a lot of like, I I will knock doors and get permission, but a lot of people will just like have an old guy sure. drinking a beer, peeing in their back bushes, like what are you doing? Of course, they're not going to like that. And that's what they're going to think all hunters are like, if you do that. So it uh, yes. causes a lot of issues. But, um, Yeah, I, I just wanted to talk to you about a couple of things that I jotted down, but I really appreciate you first of all, hopping on. I know uh, you're writing a book and stuff. So if you want to, you want to explain who you are and kind of the things that you do um, for the general public that doesn't know the greatest bow hunter of all time. <laughs> well, thank you. Well, my name's John Eberhardt. I uh been bow hunting for since nineteen I don't know. I don't even remember the actual year. I think it was sixty five is when I started. Obviously with a recurve and fingers and uh nobody in my family hunted, so I'm self taught, which is a in my opinion a really good thing because when you're taught by old school people, you know, they're they were typically gun hunters and you just learn bad habits. So being self taught is cool because you react to things differently than when you got this preconceived notion of how you're supposed to hunt in your mind. Um, and I've, uh, I bow hunt, I strictly bow hunt and, uh, strictly 100% every deer I've ever killed has been either on public land or knock on doors for free permission properties or free walk on them. Shot a couple of free walk on properties out of state. And I've got 34 in the Michigan record book off those types of properties which is uh, uh i don't think anybody else in michigan has 34 bucks in the record book with Bo. mitch um, rumpala no i'm just kidding no no he doesn't just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> he might have half of that <laughs> he doesn't have 34 and um and then i've got 20 from out of state so i started going out of state in 97 because during Michigan's gun season because I just was bored and I've taken 20 Pope and Young up to 180 inch bucks out of state and I've hunted in Ohio, Illinois, all, again, all public and knock on door properties. Ohio, Illinois, Iowa, Kansas, Missouri. 
and I've written three books with my eldest son, and I'm writing another book right now. Uh, it's going to be a saddle hunting book, but it's going to have all general whitetail bow hunting information in it, just like my other three books did. And um, I, I feel pretty fortunate because Michigan, in my opinion, and I've hunted in a lot of states, and my son Chris hunted in a lot of states when he was with us, and he hunted a lot up in the Northeast. He hunted in Maine and Massachusetts and a couple other of those small states. And Michigan is, is by far, in my opinion, is the most difficult state as far as pressure. We have 350,000 bow hunters, which is about 80,000 more than the next closest state. Um, I think it's either Pennsylvania or Wisconsin is number two. I think it's Pennsylvania, but they've dropped since or after the COVID surge, but I own to like 250 or something now. Yeah, I don't. I don't think they ever had pork. Um, I don't. I don't remember. It's a lot. Millions. Yeah, they got a lot. Their their number is three. Um, and Wisconsin always, even though Wisconsin has a lot of bow hunters, Wisconsin always enters the most pulp and young bucks out yeah. of all the states. They they always enter about six hundred. That's what they just enter. And also Wisconsin and Illinois and Kansas and Iowa, those lightly those states where the big bucks are notoriously from. Um, their average score of the bucks that are entered in the record book are about 15 inches higher than like a Michigan and a PA and a New York in the states up there in the Northeast where there's, you know, a lot of people. And any of the states where there's a high general population, you know, per the land mass, you know, those are heavily pressured states. So pretty much Michigan, New York, PA, um, all the small states, Vermont, Massachusetts, uh, uh, Maine's not really, even though it's up in the Northeast, it's a lot of landmass uh, for the amount of population it's got. But, but, yeah. uh, and then the South, you know, the South, we always buy, send to vocally bypass the South, but man, Southern states are tough too, because scent control's a bitch down there. As you know, I'm a scent control guy. I've paid zero attention. I haven't since 1997. And in the South, they're hunting and it's 80, 90 degrees early season. So, um, you know, as, as difficult as scent control is to maintain, it's it would be really hard when it's that that warm. You know, you'd sweat to death just with your entries and exits. So, so I, I kind of feel sorry for those guys down there. But there's there's a lot of states in the South that are really tough too: Georgia, uh, Louisiana, Alabama. A lot of those Southern states really really tough to kill a buck. Yeah, um, and yeah, I think it's interesting. I don't know if everyone in Iowa necessarily even enters a Pope and Young because it's probably like, oh, it's just another Pope and Young. So I, I'm i curious what the sway is for the book records that way, if how many of those are actually like entered. Um, well, for the, bigger the, the stats actually kind of show the discrepancy because like the average score from a Michigan or a PA of all, you know, when you take all of the bucks that are entered in P and Y from those, the high, high pressured states, they average about 128 to 129 when you average them all out. Whereas when you take the bucks from your Iowa's and your Kansas's, your Missouri's, your Wisconsin's, your Ohio's, Illinois, Indiana, they average like 142, 141. So they average a lot higher, which obviously means it's not a big deal you know a lot of people shoot 12 and young bucks they don't even enter, enter them in the book i would bet the entry rates and every state's like that i mean there's i i would bet in michigan probably less than half of the people that kill a and buck enter it in a PNY book uh, but i think there's a lot higher percentage of PNY bucks that get taken in those big buck states in the midwest uh, that never get entered in that kind of show because the average scores are so much higher. Do you have a lot of problem with poachers and baiting in Michigan, places like that? I don't know the rules for baiting, but a lot of times in New Hampshire, I'll just see illegal corn piles and things because we don't have a whole lot of agriculture. So there'll be people that I feel like won't even enter these bucks purely based off the fact that they know they poached it. Um, I was a scorer for like, 30 years and baiting was legal and it was banned, I don't know, probably seven or eight years ago. Um, but there's still, 
there's still beets and apples and corn sold at almost every gas station in deer country. So a real, I think well over 50% of the bow hunters still hunt over bait. And if they shoot a buck, um, I don't think they would be shy to enter it because <laughs> nobody's going to know other than them. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, it's not something I pay attention to. I, I'm kind of anti-bait, but if it's legal, it's legal. You know, I'm not a big crossbow yep. advocate either, but they're legal. So it is what it is. I'm, I'm only shooting 40 pound bow because my shoulders are so messed up. And, um, you know, my next step, I have to go to a crossbow. List. So I'm not going to shoot a crossbow unless I have to, because I'm physically not able. And the lowest legal limit for a compound bow in Michigan is 40 pounds. So if I, I get to the point where I can't shoot it 40 pounds, I, I won't have an option and I will dread the day I have to hunt with a crossbow because I think they're short range guns, but that's just my opinion. No, I, I feel the same way. I think, and I like New Hampshire stance on it. I could be wrong and people could correct me in the comments, but I'm pretty sure unless you're a senior citizen or like over 70 or unless you have specific permit that like a disability you can't shoot a crossbow. And once you do switch to a crossbow, you can't go back. That's my mm -hmm. understanding for New Hampshire. But I like that because it makes it fair. So it's not like everyone and their mother can use a crossbow and be flinging guns. Ba they're basically like bullets. Let's not like swing. Well, you, double, you can double your range. With crossbow. They're a, they're no a, problem. Gun, a gun with an arrow, basically. <laughs> and I... I'm shocked how many deer get injured and survive with crossbows. It just amazes me. Well, I I think a lot of gun hunters convert to crossbows because, you know, they can hunt now with a gun-like weapon during bow season when it's warmer out. Uh, you get to see a lot more social interaction with deer. You know, gun season, they're just running around trying to find a place to hide, basically. So uh, it's a lot more enjoyable to bow hunt, you know, to hunt during bow season just because of the weather and you get to see the social activity. It's a lot, it's, it, 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 it can be more interactive if you rattle it, you know, use sense or whatever, decoys or whatever. Whereas it, that doesn't work that well during gun season. Because pre rut's your favorite, right? Or is it changed to late season? Um, when I go out of state, I like post. Um, so I'm, typically when I'm going out of state, it's in late November. Uh, but in Michigan, I can't hunt. I mean, late season here is worthless because yeah. once gun season's over, Orange Army, you're, yeah, you're not going to see a, a buck that you want to, you know, you're not going to see a PMY buck after gun season. It's just not going to happen in the daytime. They're, they're buried in the swamp someplace till after, probably half hour after dark before they even move. Um, so it's tough. I think, I think in 50 some years, I've got two or possibly three bucks in December that were made book in Michigan. But I've shot quite a few out of state because that's, that's when I go as post run yeah. because nobody's out there then. When I go yeah. out of post yeah. run, everybody's gone, gone as far as non-residents. They all go last week, October, the first two weeks in November. So on my last podcast, I interviewed a guy that's been shed hunting and hunting in new hampshire since the 80s and he told me that the amount of deer in new hampshire for i think it was 1980 was 110 deer killed with a bow total the entire state wow 110 <laughs> and i think deer or antler bucks or no deer, deer. deer. how many licenses not, not bucks deer and okay. there was a lot of hunters it was just there wasn't a lot of bow hunters everyone was the the big tradition here is to track deer in the snow so back then we did have a lot harsher winters um so people would track them okay i'm looking here at stats from 2012 because the last stats i did were 2012 because that's when crossbows became legal in most states so once crossbows were legal uh they a crossbow hunter just bought an archery license. So you couldn't go P and Y num entries versus in you know, you couldn't divide P and Y entries into licensed bow hunting bow hunters because a lot of the licenses were crossbow guys. So I'm looking at New Hampshire 
And in New Hampshire in uh, 2012, they had 18,500 bow hunters. They entered three Pope and Young bucks, and it shows one out of six, 9,300 square miles, absolute square miles. That's the land mass. So let me divide this. Hold on. There's only three in the entire state. Yes. Oh, I couldn't just say. Yeah, there was three Pope and Young Bucks entered in New Hampshire oh, in 2012. Most people enter them here, I feel like. But... Most people what? Most people enter them here, I feel like, because it is a rarity to get a good buck like that. Well, things have changed. I mean, over yeah. the last 10 years, yeah, lots of people have some bucks. There's way more big bucks now everywhere. 100%. I mean, I, in the last, even since I've been hunting in the last three or four years i remember my neighbor he said anything that was over 115 inches was a giant and he killed his biggest buck this year that was it was seven and a half years old i call it chompy he was like the first deer that i missed and he was probably 145 inches this year yeah and, uh, that's a dandy <laughs> and that was that was a very good buck granted So, but it is what it is, and it's you just gotta know what your morals are and try to go. Yeah, and so. it's at one odd, so that was one out of every six thousand one hundred and sixteen bow hunters entered a Pope and Young Buck, yeah. which makes sense. Eighteen thousand bow hunters, one out of every six thousand, so that'd be great. Yeah, it's. Uh, there's not a ton, but it is, uh, it's, it's hard to find a mature one. I, I said this also in my last podcast, but a lot of people utilize cell cameras now. So that's totally changed the game of how I used to be like, oh, trail cameras are bad because of the scent on the straps. I clean them because I know that the mature bucks would look up. Even if I put it 15 feet in a tree and turned it down, I still had mature bucks looking. And part of that was probably because my foot scent, even though I use rubber boots, I didn't really wash them. So that could have been part of it. There's a lot of different factors, but I was always like kind of afraid of trail cameras. And I was like, oh, it's just going to be for future data. It's not going to be something that I'll use for this year. But now you have cell cameras that are getting instantaneous feed, even though there's um, now a rule that says like within a 24 hour period or a calendar day, you can't hunt that deer that you get pictures of. There's no way to stop people from doing that. No, no not Kansas actually banned them for this year. Yeah. So, which I was kind of shocked. I, that's the first I'd ever heard of that. But yeah. I'm just curious, were you using, uh, you said you strapped them on. So were you using cameras with black straps? Or were you, because I use those screw-in mounts that you screw into the tree and the main camera mount face of it. So you're not, you don't have that black strap around a great mark tree. Yeah, so I usually use a, a thick enough tree where I when I strap it around, so it was the back was I knew the deer wasn't going to go behind the camera because it's too thick of an area that like I know deer can go through thick stuff, but it like they just physically that's not where the trails were. And it's a swamp and the, the, if they're going to go in the swamp, they'll go farther around the camera. So when the camera's pointed down on this field edge on this side post there, they'd walk around it and he looked up into the side and I know he he either heard it click. I There might be a setting. Oh, that he okay. switch. Either that or he, he smelled it because I tie the strap down so it doesn't flap in the wind because I know that doesn't look natural. And it, and it's like if you're pulling up your bow, a lot of people will like put the string back down that they pull their bow up. But you just left a scent wick right to the ground. <laughs> like I would, uh, never, I would never even consider doing that. <laughs> but yeah, man, some people do. But when I started, I had no clue. I didn't care about scent control. I didn't know what the heck I was doing until I started listening to you and stuff. You know what? That is that blows me away more than anything in deer hunting whatsoever. Uh, people have the they can it's very affordable. Selling lock is extremely affordable. It's not expensive. It's the only clothing, exterior clothing that has activated carbon. They own the patent on using it. And for people to be able to not have to pay attention to wind direction and not ever worry about getting winded and they don't do it blows my mind. That is the biggest defense of your ass is their nose. John, they you are nose to, 
to know this people and human odor uh humans they pick off humans with their nose way more than their eyes or their ears way more it's not even close and people disregard scent control just shocks me but that's okay because to me you can't say somebody is an extremely excellent hunter if they don't have a scent control regimen because it's out there and if they don't want to take advantage of it they're missing opportunities without any question in my mind i think i think a lot of it's not the expense i think it's just because people are lazy because you do have to put in extra time like and not get dressed until you get to your location or even to the stand and i don't think a lot of people are willing to do that for for start well that's not quite right you should always dress at your vehicle so when you're brushing against vegetation you're not leaving odor on the vegetation i always dress in my vehicle and walk walk to my stand and climb no, that the... that's what i'm saying yeah oh okay yeah yeah but i'm saying like if i have like a like the other scent lock and then i don't want to put it on my like big jacket because i don't want to be like sweating like crazy i'll have my undergarment and then i'll put on my big oh, lock okay. i'm gonna be hiking or whatever but yeah, I don't want to go too in depth about scent control just because I know we both have strong opinions and we already agree on that. So <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll let Give me something we disagree on. <laughs> yeah, so I do. I do want to ask you what's your biggest tip you can give um, hunters on public land um, when it comes to like primary scrapes. I know you say you don't care about the wind, but do you care about the wind when it comes to the bucks perspective? I do. I do. When I, anytime I set up a primary scrape area, if the area offers it, first off, on public land, the, the mistake most people make on public land is they hunt open timber. Okay. They hunt timber that doesn't have security cover underneath the canopy or they're just not hunting brush or swamps. You know, they're, they're not hunting in this heavy security cover, which on public lands, that's where they push the big bucks. You know, the, the preseason scouting, everybody's, the, I do everything postseason. I do everything. My stuff's totally finished scouting, prepping locations by the end of April, prior to green. Most people, at least 90% of people, they do all their scouting and location preparation a month and a half prior to season. So if you've got a two and a half or a three and a half year old buck or older on public land, he's smart. He's been educated from the previous gun seasons. And as soon as he notices that big influx of human activity, he moves back into deeper, deeper security cover. You know, he may be betting all through the summer and in the spring in more open areas, close feeding areas, because there's no pressure. As soon as there's any semblance of human influx of activity, they move back into the deeper stuff. So the biggest thing that bow hunters on public land do not do is they don't look at everything as security cover oriented you know security cover security cover security cover i can't overstate that if you're hunting on public land you've got to be back in the security cover and you like if i found a scrape area let's say let's say i found a scrape area and it had pretty decent security cover around it perimeter security cover around it but it was not in a bedding area it's out in a let's say a feeding area let's say it's in a stand of oaks and there was a, a primary scrape, two or three scrapes. And the timber was relatively open, didn't have any understory, you know, security cover underneath the canopy of the timber. And there was a bedding area 200 yards away. So on an evening hunt, this buck that I'm trying to kill that, you know, I may have on camera at these scrapes after dark. Or it, there, there's some buck rubs there also that are, you know, four foot high. So I know it's mature deer. It's the buck rubs are high. You know, for him to come and visit that scrape area in the evening, if he's bedded back in that bedding area, he has to come through that open timber to get to that scrape area. Well, he's not going to do that. He's not going to do that in the day to daylight. So people have to realize that in order to have the kill a big buck on public land that gets pressured, Everything has to be security cover oriented. The location you're hunting at has to have perimeter security cover around the kill zone. If you're hunting at an apple tree or an oak tree or a chestnut tree or a scrape area, plus you have to have adequate transition security cover from your hunting location to a known bedding area because a buck has to be close to or within security cover when he's moving in the daylight. He has to have a quick exit. 
security exit. And if he doesn't, he's not going to make that that movement during the daylight. So you've got to be either back in the bedding areas where everything is security cover oriented, or if you're hunting a location outside of a bedding area, it has to have excellent transition security cover to that location. So it's, I guess my main thing is most most people on public land hunt too open of areas. When I do my postseason scouting on public lands, 90% of the stands that I see are out in open timber. They're in areas I wouldn't even think of hunting. You know, for me to hunt on public land, usually I've got to wear waders or hip boots to access the place I'm going to hunt. Yeah. Because if, ever, if I can walk to it easily, so can anybody else, and it's going to be screwed up. I like your rule of thumb where it's basically if you, if you can walk up straight without going under something no. or around Probably. something that's then Cross the river. yeah so and once i changed that i did see a lot more deer and i i mean i got on some huge bucks for new england i just didn't capitalize because they either got not necessarily spooked but they just weren't in range which which was unfortunate but i got on some really big ones or one i saw across the swamp um, that was bedded with a doe so he was tending to her pushing her up against the swamp but there was no way for me to get to the other side of the swamp so I tried to circle around and I don't know where they went but uh, I tried to spot and stalk them but it's just mountain laurel like this and it's impossible to sneak up on it. Stalking a whitetail is pretty tough <laughs> it's, <laughs> especially in cover because yeah. you're making you can't do it without making noise unless it's windy or rainy. I, I did it in Idaho but this you can't do that that's wide open plains and like safe. like mule deer yeah muleys you can spot and stalk easily but not white tails are pretty tough yeah so that was that was super tough but um so the next thing i want to talk about this might offend some people um but i'm the same way with you i don't i don't like to do any pre-scouting in like september or anything like that i may do like a quick walk through like max just to see if there's rub lines um, but I won't go into security cover and go into those deep places because they're betting there. Um, but what I have a problem with is sometimes people will be like, you need to run your trail camera all year long. And this is where the buck's going to be in velvet out right when he's growing those nubs. I need to have my trail cameras out. And I'm like, it doesn't matter because that's not where he lives in the hunting season, especially in New England. A lot of these deer are moving four, six, eight miles from their summer range to their winter range. And I'm like, why do you care if seeing the buck in velvet? I think it's because they want to see photos of the deer growing more than they actually care about how that information is going to help them. I think a lot of people, because they're not good at killing mature bucks, they want to at least get pictures of them. <laughs> That's, I, I hate to say that because it's kind of an egotistical thing, but I think it's kind of true. Um you know, I, I use cameras. I didn't use to use cameras. I, as you well know, I was not an advocate of cameras because back before they were cell cameras, you had to physically visit a location and pull your SD card. And that was an intrusion that could ruin that spot if it was at a hunting location. Yep. So uh, I use I use cell cameras a lot now um, and with solar panels. And I always use a stick with double laters to mount it about 14 feet up. So I'm mounting it about the same height as you are. Um, but I haven't had any deer, I haven't had any deer look at it. You know, anytime I put them in the ground, it's, like it. it's, it's only been that once and I don't know why it happened, but it did. Okay. I mean, he was a mature buck. He was like a five-year-old, so he wasn't dumb. So I, I, I have no clue why anybody thinks they need to have their camera out. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, our deer don't travel 12 or 14 miles from their summer range to their fall range. But they definitely will change from where they're bedding in the spring, you know, when they start to grow their antlers, from where they're going to be in the fall. Because a lot of times, even mature bucks, they'll get into bachelor groups in the summer, you know, three or four good bucks. And then once once season gets here, and then they start sparring for pecking order, you know, the local herd pecking order, if you will, dominance, then they split up and they move and they go in different areas. Um so, yeah, I think some people take it a little bit out of whack because there is absolutely no reason whatsoever that you have to have a cell camera up <laughs> in the summer. I don't put cell cameras up till usually about the 1st of September when they start rubbing out. Yeah. 
Yeah, That's by August 20th is usually when I see them rub out here. Um, and that's just been a trend I've seen for the couple of years that I have had trail cameras up, but I mean, and that's the, typically the bigger bucks, I'm assuming the smaller ones are a little later or not. I'd say even, even the smaller ones by the end of August, they're about all rubbed out. It's very rare. I only know two people that have shot a velvet buck where I live and, and, our, season and our season opens the 15th of September. So. But you are a few days earlier than us. Usually, usually by September 5th, all of our two and a half year old molar bucks are rubbed out. But I, I have seen, you know, spikes and threes and four points, year and a half old sporting bucks with velvet. Not very often, but once in a while during the first day or two of season, I'll see, once in a while I'll see a buck still in velvet. But it's but that's rare. Usually they're all it, all of them are usually out by September 15th. Yeah. But so you're I, earlier than us. Yeah, we're a, we're a little bit earlier than a lot of places, but does yours go to December 15th? Or when, Sorry. Is, when does your bow season end? Uh, January 1st. Oh, wow. Holy crap. We have 54 days of guns. Wow. Yeah. And I mean, well, hell, look at Ohio. Oh, well, I think Ohio runs till mid February. Uh, Kansas is through the end of January. Yeah, there's a lot of states that go into January, some into February. It's crazy that a lot more, I know it happens, but I'm surprised it doesn't happen more where antlers fall off, like when they're shooting them. I know it happens, like I've had friends that it's happened to, but it's just interesting. Oh, I've shot bucks and grabbed their antlers and had them fall off. I've had that happen in, mid, in mid-December. Yeah. I mean, small. I mean, back in the 70s, smaller bucks, you know, yeah. it's a little eight point or something. And the buck I shot in Kansas last year was uh, uh, December 15th. And I, during that hunt, I saw bucks that had already shed their antlers. Yeah. The earliest I've seen is around Christmas here. Um, but I, the latest, my a small eight point, or he was a nine point, but I found his four point side. And he held till April 6th. So, I mean... That was crazy late, but it just depends on how bad the winter is. Yeah. This this winter has been extremely mild besides like the polar vortex. And then a couple of weeks ago, we got two feet, but that was like it. It's the rest of the storms have been really small. And like today it was like, felt like it was 70 out. So I did all my, I did all my spring work today. I <laughs> put, yeah. got the lawnmower, put away the snow blower, got my boat out. Took the cover off it. It's ready to go in the lake tomorrow. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> awesome. Do you do bass fishing or what do you do? Walleye? I fish for everything. You name it. Steel there. I don't think there's a species of fish in Michigan I have not caught. Other than a sturgeon. I've got muskies, pike, bass, smallies, largemouth, specks, bluegills, red ears, uh, perch, walleyes, uh, everything. I fish for steelhead salmon. Brom. You have a muskie mount, don't you? In your basement? Uh, no, that's a 44-inch northern pike. Oh, pike, okay. It looks like a musk, but it's a pike. We have pickerel. I don't think we have pike. I, I tried eating one on this, like, camp out that we had when I did Boy Scouts, and it, uh, <laughs> it did not taste too good. We call really? them snot rockets here. They're so slimy. I don't... Uh... <laughs> I never clean a pike unless it's over 30 inches, because pike have wide yeah. bones. They have Y bones up above their spine on the top quadrant, and they're big pieces of meat going along the top. And you have to fillet those Y bones out because they actually come out from the spine and then they have a Y. So it's almost not worth eating the fish if it's not over 30 inches and you got enough meat to fillet that Y out. But man, yeah. pike, pike are kind of a yellowish meat and they're very sweet if you cook them right. Yeah, the, the pickerel is probably 14 inches covered in slime and oh, we have no God. clue what we're doing, John. That'd be solid bones. <laughs> it was, uh, I, I think I basically crushed up like cornflakes and put it on it on the campfire. So it, uh, got some bones in your mouth too, I bet you. Oh, I, yeah. There's well, a lot of bones in the small Okay. I'm a, I'm a big bass fisher and that's how I got into the outdoors. But yeah, we're getting off topic. Sorry. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But yeah, when it when it comes to public land, it's that's one of the things that I've had difficulty is I try to hunt a mature buck and I've tried to like hunt specific deer and it's been extremely tough here um, just because of how big the home ranges of these deer are. Yep. So I'll give you one 
perspective. So I live on the Massachusetts border. So I live right, like my backyard is literally Mass. Yeah. Uh, and I live in New Hampshire and it intersects with the the state line. So you can't obviously go hunting too far behind my house unless you have a different type of license for the other state. So there was a giant buck probably 10 miles from my house, we'll say. And he summered in Massachusetts, giant buck. And in 2020, which is the last season I've been able to hunt here in New England because I've been at college, um, the buck would travel from there and he would come into a neighborhood. And then I found him stalking around in a swamp on the edge with my bow to try to get to my spot. And I bumped him up. And this buck's just rack just went whoosh, whoosh. And I was like, oh my goodness, that's like a 150 inch deer. And I wasn't, I wasn't exaggerating, but I was like, he must be bedded with a doe or something. I didn't see another deer though. Okay. All by himself that I guarantee you that buck would never bed there ever in his entire life. It's off a main trail where there's hikers, but because I went around on a swamp Island, he was right there <laughs> in that corner. And I know he doesn't bed there because there's no beds there and there's no like reason why he would be there other than he probably had a doe there or he just wanted to get away from other deer i i I don't know a logical reason of why he was there but that the wind was right why was the hiking trail then why is there a hiking trail is this suburbia it's a state forest why is there a hiking trail there we just have a we have a lot of logging and hiking trails throughout our state forests. A lot of does it get used on? Does it's that hiking trail get used quite a bit? You think a lot by hunters. Oh, okay. I mean, I mean, probably three hundred yards away, there's tree stands, but oh, did I lose you? Oh, no. Nope. Um, probably three hundred yards away, four hundred yards away. Everyone takes this one path, and then in the hardwoods, like you say, where I'd never even considered a hunt, where there's been um like forest um, cuts and stuff like that. It's open and I would never hunt there in a million years, but he was on the edge in the laurel where basically there's no way you could sneak up on him um, against the swamp. And I was just like shocked that he was there. But then in 2022, I get a text. You just, from you just answered your own question. Well, yeah, I guess I did. But it was weird. Nobody, that he, you couldn't I, sneak up on him and you're next to a hiking trail. so. People walking by that are not a threat because they're just entering and exiting to go yeah. hunting. Um, that kind of reminds me. I finish your story first. Anyways, right. finish your story. I'll, I'll finish it, but we'll get right back to that. So, anyway, so this buck obviously survived 2020 and 2021 because I get a text uh, or a call from my buddy and he says, Did you hear about the giant buck that was killed on the state line? And the buck ended up um going over into new hampshire and a kid had never killed a deer before in his entire life and he had a cell camera and a rifle and he went out and he shot this buck and it's now the top 10 new hampshire record and is 179 gross inches and i was like oh my gosh i wish i could have got him but i was extremely happy for the kid like that's a, a buck of a million lifetimes here <laughs> But I was like, oh, my gosh, that is just a giant deer. When you said that buck, there's no way you could sneak up on that buck to kill him where he was bedded. That's a very good reason for him to be bedded there. Because uh, a buck could be bedded there if it's laurel and have people walk by. You know, you hear people probably pull in the parking lot, close doors, talk, walk, you know, 100 yards from the parking lot. I don't know how far it was from the parking area. Or, 200 yards whatever well how far was it it wasn't too cl it was probably 800 yards well yeah like half a mile yeah half mile okay well anyway if people are walking by and they're just on a brisk walk like they're entering to go hunting someplace else they're not a threat and mature yeah. mature bucks can tell when activity is not a threat for instance um, I hunt a spot and there's a two and a half acre parcel on the corner of an intersection. And this is rural America. This is, there's, there's a little tiny store there, country store, and there's a red, yellow, green light there on the corner. And there's a two and a half acre piece 
and it's tall weeds with a little crick right by the corner, literally 60 yards off the corner. And uh, the guy I know that hunts in that area, he got permission to go in there and look for morels, and he found that buck dead. It was a 165-incher, and he was living in that little two-and-a-half-acre parcel with cars parking there, people getting out right across the road, going in the store all the time. That's where that buck was living. Because somebody else had seen that buck there in the daytime, you know, alive. Yeah. And he found it there dead. So bucks are really, really good at differentiating activity that's danger and activity that's where they're vulnerable. So, you know, another good example. I had a good friend uh, that was hunting in southern Illinois on a draw deal. It was a 16,000 acre piece of public land. And he always drew for November. So he got to hunt the pre rut early November. And he went there three years in a row and never killed a thing. And there's like a couple hundred bow hunters on this 16,000 acres each week on this draw. And um, he said there was always a couple, two or three room, really big bucks that were shot, you know, 150 to 180 inch. And I said, yeah, but do the math. You got 200 bow hunters on there. At minimum is 200 bow hunters. If there's four bucks, big bucks that get killed, you know, that's 2%. Four yeah. bucks out of 200 people, that's 2% odds killing a buck, a monster. I said, why don't you do, because I've done this many times on public land. I've waited until the late season. And then I wait, you know, when I'm going to go to Illinois or, or Kansas, I wait until I see a snowstorm coming on the weather forecast. And then most of those big pieces of public land, they have park rangers. So you can physically call the park and talk to the park ranger to see if they got the snow that was on yep. the forecast. And if they got six to eight, 10 inches of fresh snow, and you got your vehicle loaded and ready for bear, you take off. Okay, so when you get there, you're going to be scouting the property 24 hours, you know, within 24 hours of the snow falling. So everything you see in tracks wise and runways, it's going to be sign made within the last 24 hours. Yeah. Because a lot of times you go down there in early November or whatever, you go, you always go out and scout before you hunt. You got to look around. You know, you see runways and you see rubs. You don't know if it was made yesterday or three days ago or whatever. When you go out after a fresh snow, you're looking at sign that was made within the last 24 hours. So he did that. The very next year, I said, you really need to try this. Because I've done it successfully several times. Um, on 160 inch deer. And so the next year he did that. He did not apply for the November. And in December, it's open. Anybody can go there in December and hunt anytime they want because nobody hunts in December. So he went down there after a snowfall, called the park ranger. Yeah, we got the snow. He scouted right behind the park ranger building where the park ranger house is, basically, yeah. within 100 yards. As soon as, you, as soon as it was far enough behind the ranger shack, to hunt and there was a big ass runway that was well used within 24 hours and it was going right along the back property line of the ranger house and he hunted <laughs> sat there first evening he shot a big ass eight point. i i mean sometimes you don't need to go deeper sometimes you just need to look for overlooked spots for sure yeah that was an overlooked spot nobody thought they would be a big buck walking you know transitioning that close to the ranger house and I'm sure that ranger guy, he knew, I'm sure he saw that buck move through there many times, but he ain't going to tell everybody because then he'll get shot. Yeah. And so a lot of times they'll, they'll be walking through people's backyards and just because they don't see them doesn't mean they're not there. So sometimes I'll ask Absolutely. for permission on someone's door and they're like, I mean, I have a really good, I take a tactical approach how to get permission and stuff and dress nice and make myself look like... Yeah nice and like go at a good time of day where i'm not interrupting um but some people will be like no there's not deer back there i'm like oh no there's deer back there like i know then you don't mind if i hunt right <laughs> yeah exactly right you don't mind then because there's nothing that's gonna run into your yard dead <laughs> but uh but yeah it's it's interesting sometimes like even in my backyard we'll have does but they'll never be here during or the the bucks will never be here during hunting season we might have a a buck a season maybe 
So we, you just have to go out and find books. You just can't assume that they'll come to you. And that's one of the biggest things that I've learned. Well, when we, when we go out West, you know, we always stop and talk to the farmers. We've got a couple of places where we've got free permission and only got one left now, but we've lost them all the leases. Um, but when we shoot bucks over the years, when we've shot monster bucks over the years, you know, up to 170 inches, the farmers never saw them. You know, they, they'll once in a while, they'll send us a text of a buck they see out in the crop fields, you know, and it'll be 130 inch or something. And oh, that's nice. But yeah, they don't know what's there for the most part. Nope. They're, they're not. That's, you know, they're farmers. They're yeah. they're not paying attention. To it. And we always kill big bucks. And every time you take it and show it to them, and they're like, wow, I never did that. It was there. And you always got to be cautious showing it to property owners you got to trust the property owner yeah. too because then if he shows a picture to all his buddies you're not going to get to hunt there anymore because his buddies are or or he's going to want to hunt there start hunting because there's a big deer or something like that so you never know um but that leads me to another thing i i love people and i think we should be supportive of people but it also it's mind-blowing how many people don't know what they're doing but do a couple things right and then they kill a big buck or they are hunting in the open hardwoods and maybe one will run through and it's the dumbest thing ever. And the deer's huffing and puffing, just dogging a doe and you get lucky. And I see that in New Hampshire all the time. People haven't killed a deer in 11 years and they hunt and then they kill one big deer. I'm like, why can't I, like, I see them more often than other people, but I just haven't been able to calculate. But it's just like, I also don't gun hunt. I'm going to start this year, but I didn't gun hunt, so that was another factor that if I had that or a muzzle loader, I could have killed some of them. But I'm just like, it amazes me how many people don't know what the heck they're doing. Don't do scent lock. Don't their fault, you know. If they no, don't yeah. don't yeah. know, you just don't know. You've never been taught. Um, and and with a gun, anything can happen. Our state record was killed by a guy that borrowed a buddy's gun and hunted behind his buddy's house and shot a 198 inch typical. I had 12 point, I think, and that's the state record. Another guy, I was talking in a sport shop. I was a sales rep for 30 years. I've been in a sport shop, and this guy came over to me, and he recognized me from my YouTube stuff. And um, he said, man, you ain't going to believe what happened, what happened to us last year. My damn son, who's 16, you know, it was going to be his first year going to the Upper Peninsula, on a gun hunt, you know, the whole family goes up there. It was going to be his first year, and he got a bad report card, so he had to stay home. And they lived in Jackson County, which is the number one county in the state for big bucks. It's in southern Michigan. UP's way up north in swamp country. And so anyway, the kid, the night before deer season, all his family and grandpa and uncles are up in the UP. He asked his mom, you care if I go hunting behind the house in the morning? He shot 176 inches. Ten point <laughs> on the house opening day gun season. <laughs> yeah, that stuff happens all the time with a gun because deer are just running around find, trying to find a place to hide or people bump them. You know, it, it happens a lot with a gun. It doesn't happen that much with a bow where someone yeah. slaps one in. But it, it happens with a bow, but not as common. Yeah, it's definitely like you have to be close enough and get in the, the wheelhouse to – to harvest a bucket it's not like you can just pull up and and shoot one in a field or anything like that so yeah you can't shoot 400 yards with bow. yeah it's pretty difficult <laughs> yeah. I'm, I'm in rifle country here i'm not in shotgun zones so yeah we, we my there's a new rule that you can use like a 45 lever action or something um now in the shotgun areas um well so you know you can use it's probably a straight case 45 yeah, so yeah, I don't case, know the, it can't be a neck down. I don't own one, so I didn't worry about the rule change, but it's it's something along the lines of that that you could still probably shoot eighty to a hundred yards. So Oh, easy. Yeah. yeah. They make a four fifty uh um Bushmaster, which is a relatively new round over the last, I don't know, seven or eight years probably probably. And then uh most states now it's it's legal to shoot a thirty five caliber as long as it's straight straight case and they they make a 350 legend now which a lot of people are buying it's a straight case and that's easy 200 easy 200 yard gun yeah it's interesting i mean things are getting easier but there's also the government stepping in what do you think about like kansas banning trail cameras and the government kind of coming in and telling some of the things that we can and can't do do you think it's good for 
for deer or bad for hunting? I never think the government telling you what you can can and can't do is a good thing. Um, you know, I've I've never been an APR advocate. I I don't like the government telling me what to do with my personal life, uh, and I don't want to make everybody that deer hunts have to be under mandatory APR restrictions just because I want to kill bigger bucks. You know, um, I think that's pretty critical to not want the government to make you do things but yet you want everybody else to do what you want so that there's going to be more big bucks for you to kill hopefully kill one um so what's uh, apr antler point restrictions oh yeah okay that's what like pennsylvania now they're uh they're on entire states apr uh the timber area of pennsylvania is a three point on a side or better and the ag area is four points on a side or better and with Michigan has some APR colonies. That's what I was going to ask if you guys did, because I know in Pennsylvania that's created. Back then it was like an eight pointer. Like in Jimmy in school, the teacher would be like, Jimmy shot an eight pointer. Congrats. He was in the newspaper. And now it's like they killed a couple 190s in the state last year. So, oh, yeah. Pennsylvania's became much, much, much better than it used to be. Yeah. When, that's like what they do. And the actual head of the Department of Natural Resources resigned because he was getting death threats and, and yeah. was being, and that, that that whole fiasco in pennsylvania because pennsylvania's got a seriously deep you know hunting heritage yes it and, is. uh Deer man camp. man to have the state ram aprs down your throat that didn't go over well for a few years it's very well accepted now they, they kind of like it i think but oh, that, yeah. that was a struggle for several years well, my, my neighbor owns some property in Pennsylvania, so he's been doing a deer camp there with all of his buddies for 20 years or something. And he said, like, they everyone is really mad at Gary Alcohol or whatever his name is and, like, the death threats and all that stuff. But he said now I think everyone's just happy because they did see, like, now they're seeing crazy mature. Oh, they're killing nice bucks. Yeah. Yeah. So Everybody's killing, uh, you know, instead of killing – 90 inch two year olds are killing 110 20 inch uh three and a half year olds yeah yeah that's that's pretty common out there now i if i do these whitetail workshops and i have every workshop i've got is one or two guys from pennsylvania and well, if they like in at the store or whatever that your mounts are at yeah uh well the seminar it, they're two-day workshops so first day is out in the woods all day visiting hunting locations gotcha and the second day is an all-day seminar at Jay's Sporting Goods, and I've got 68 deer heads on the wall there. Yeah, I was showing my buddy. I was like, I, I'm having John on the the podcast because he's not a he's not a huge hunter, but he hunts in Maryland over like a cornfield. So if he he can just go out whenever and shoot a deer, so it's just <laughs> it's different because it's all like private and stuff. But I with a I, gun, yeah, with with a gun or a crossbow. So. For him, he doesn't really understand, and a lot of people that I know don't understand, like, the challenge of hunting a pressured state. Like, it, it's just, it's not the same, and we're never going to agree on it, that, like, me going to Idaho, although there's some that's getting leased and there's a lot of private land, the hunting there was extremely easy, and I was seeing bucks every other day, or every day, if not almost every time I hunted, whether it was a four corn or an eight point. I was seeing deer and there was a lot of them. I could go out every single night if I wanted, glass a field and there will be deer at dusk. Here, I when I came home in the late season, you would think, oh, if I go around to every field, I'll be able to see a deer. Didn't see one within 15 miles of my house. <laughs> yeah, so, that's, that's pretty common. I've, I mean, I've been on hunts in Kansas where I'll see 18 pulp young bucks in a week and I won't see 18 Pope and Young Bucks in Michigan in 10 years. You know, if I, I've been, I've went three complete seasons in a row in Michigan without seeing one Pope and Young Buck. So, it, yeah, it's a struggle, but you can't just say the states because, Correct. you know, there's, you know, Michigan has a lot of private leases and private properties where they're managing their properties, co ops and stuff. So, you know, there's areas in Michigan that, uh, are pretty easy to hunt because it's it's managed properties. 
You know, yeah. they're not killing anything until they're three and a half years old. And, and they kind of have a co-op where a lot of property owners are in the same area doing the same thing. And even you get to states like, you know, Iowa or Missouri, you know, you get around the big cities, the Des Moines or uh, whatever, Kansas City, Missouri. You know, if there's public lands close to the big, heavily populated cities, those public lands that are close to those big cities probably get beat up pretty bad because yeah. people don't own property um, because property around big cities are more expensive because there's, uh, you know, more competition to buy the properties. So uh, a lot of people end up hunting public lands. Yeah. And I know how you feel about like super managed land, um, but do you have a problem or do you, I mean, you've obviously hunted out of state. Do you feel more satisfaction killing uh, a big buck in a harder place to hunt than if you were to kill a Pope in, or a Boone Crockett in a different state? Yeah, I I think not so much now, but 20 years ago before there was any you know, people passing up deer, everybody was, you know, all every hunter just about was just trying to kill a legal antlered buck. Um, 20 years ago, it was harder to kill a two and a half year old buck in Michigan, where I hunt on public land, than it is to kill a five or six and a half year old buck in Iowa or Kansas. Yeah. Far, far easier. It's not even comparable. You know, killing a 140-inch buck in Iowa and Kansas is not a big deal. I can do that in a week every single year. <laughs> you know, I haven't killed a 140-inch buck in Michigan in five years. Yeah. So, when, when was the last time you got a big buck? In Michigan? Anyway. I shot a 140-incher in Kansas last year. I shot a book buck in Michigan that wasn't 140. And I shot two book bucks in Michigan the year before. My biggest Michigan buck is 167. My biggest out-of-state buck is 180 inches. And to give you an idea of how much more difficult it is, you know, I've got a, I've got a good friend. He owns 40 acres here. And in 48 years of hunting, gun and bow, on 40 acres, and he hunts it by himself, but he's in an area where there's lots of property owners, a lot of small parcels, mm -hmm. so it's deer pressure. He's killed a 110 inch buck in 48 seasons on 40 acres. He's been out of state to either Illinois or Iowa 14 times on one week hunts by himself and public land. And in 14 hunts, he's killed 12 bucks between 117 and 168 inches. So on 14 one week hunts, he's killed 12 bucks between 117 and 168. And in 48 years, on his own 40 acres, hunting all season, he's killed one buck that was 110 inches. I have another good buddy that lives in Grand Rapids, Michigan, and he's been hunting 30 years. He's almost 50. And his biggest Michigan buck is 123. He's in southern Michigan, so it's agriculture down there, so they get a little bigger than up here. Yeah. Um, um, but his biggest is 123, and he's really tried to kill a 125. That's his goal in Michigan, yeah. 125. And his last two trips to Iowa, he shot on his very first evening sit. He shot a 158 and 171. Oh, my gosh. And his very first sit. He scouted all day the first day. But his very first evening sit, he shot a 158 and a 171 consecutive. Is, is it a genetics thing, John, or is it the comb combination of – people passing smaller deer or the fact that they don't let a lot of people hunt out of state there. There's just fewer hunters for one thing. So yeah. there's less hunters. Um, there, they have better crop yields per acre. So it's richer soil. The soil has more minerals in it and the same minerals that grow crops grow and give you high crop yields also grow body size and antler size. So, you know, they can have a 200 bushel per acre corn crop out there, you know, the farmers. And here, you know, if you get 110 bushel or 120 bushel per acre, that's a really good yield because we got a lot of sandy soil. There's not a lot of minerals in it. So it's they've, they've got better soil. They've got less hunting pressure. So a lot more deer live to maturity. And anytime you've got less hunting pressure, there's just a natural tendency for the residents even 
to not shoot smaller bucks because mm. they can shoot bigger bucks. So that's kind of what they wait for. So just because of them living where they're living, they're kind of managing what they're shooting as a byproduct of where they live. If you know, you know what I'm saying. Yeah. Makes so there, there's a lot. And also they, they have lighter winters. They don't have the hard winters that we have up here. You just talked about getting 20 inches of snow. <laughs> 20, 26. 26 inches and, of snow. You don't and, get that out there. So the deer and 36, are probably 30 minutes from my house, 36 inches. And in yeah, you, a day and a half. You get a heavy snowfall. You have a winter with a lot of snow. That puts a lot of stress on an animal. That sucks yeah. down a lot of their body weight. So when spring comes, they start growing their antlers. They, they, they don't start building body weight to where a lot of that stuff can go to their antlers until later into the antler development stages and these deer like where i live specifically like my town which i focused on we don't have i don't think we have any cornfields in the entire town it's not a big right. town but like my point is that there's not like soybeans they or locust trees that they can go to in the snow they're pawing to get acorns in the big woods timber it's not you, right i don't even i don't know if they eat mountain laurel I actually don't know about that. I they don't, usually, eat, I think they eat the leaves off mountain laurel. They, they might eat the leaves or the buds off them in the summer. I, I but don't. you're in an area where it's pretty much just mast. They're eating mast and and browse. Yeah. So yeah. I'll give you an example. The tree knocked down, or the <laughs> so tree, the snow knocked down because it gets really clumpy here. It yeah. dropped down one of the trees and it snapped in our yard. The deer are so hungry for browse that they ate that within a day. Yeah. And yeah we barely ever see any deer in our backyard, but they just, because that was something, or like there's arbovitae trees and we have to put up soap so they don't eat it. And there's like a layer like this, just, so if I'm driving That's through- straight the, line. <laughs> yeah, if I'm driving <laughs> through the suburbs, I'll look for that to see yeah. if there's deer in an area sometimes, but it's interesting. Yeah, especially if you get cedars and stuff. Cedars, they just, it, I, yeah, we see that up here too. Because I'm in an area in Northern Michigan where we start getting cedar swamps. And I can remember there was one big swamp and there was a lot of deer there when we got a lot of snow in the winter and you drive down the road and there'd be a hundred deer out in the cedar swamp. And I mean, it was like you took a ruler, like you just said, this is just a straight line across the bottom of the trees where they could stand up and as high as they could eat standing up on their hind legs. And that was the line. And that's kind of cool. I think that's pretty No, cool. no, I think it's, I think it's, it's a hardship on the deer. Yeah. I mean, when it's really bad, I'll sometimes see them eat tree bark, but that's when it's real bad. Like, they need anything they can get because that's not nutritious at all to them. That's pretty bad. There's farmers that are pretty shoddy at feeding their horses. And horses, I've seen trees and horse yards and stuff that have been eating on the bark and they're all skinny. Oh. That's a starvation food. Yeah. Yeah. That's sad, but... Yeah. I mean, and you look at... You look at uh, ultra management, like enclosures and stuff, you know, that's taking it to another level. So just like Iowa, you go to a deer expo. I've, I did, I've done seminars at like the Wisconsin deer expo and the deer people bring into that thing and the quantities of 150 plus inch bucks is just immense compared to what you get at the deer expo in Michigan. But then you look at some of these enclosures, God, I was watching a TV show the other day the bucks in this enclosure because they're throwing the minerals to it they had those antlers had to weigh 20 pounds 25 pounds they were three four hundred inch bucks and they were three and four years old just yeah. massive non-typical junk you know oh he's a two-year-old proud of that i mean that's sick to me. <laughs> he's 250 inches and he's a two-year-old yeah oh that's not uncommon at all yeah that's not uncommon whatsoever in some of these enclosures that's those aren't dear to me. Like my, uh, my ex-girlfriend, her friend was like, Kyle, I know you love hunting. Check out this photo. My dad killed this deer. And already I knew that her dad like hunted safaris in Africa and stuff like that. Safari club and, member, yeah. So I knew that he was that kind of a hunter. So I saw the deer and it was like huge, non-typical giant buck. And I like, Oh, that's awesome. Where, what state? And she's like, Oh, blah, blah, blah. I was like, Ooh. You see the high fence in the background. <laughs> like, <laughs> I mean, it's 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 comical to me, and I understand 
people are like, oh, we all need to get along, but that's just not hunting to me. They're pets. They're that's pets. not only not hunting, that is very negative to hunting. Yeah. I, I remember, and I actually wrote about this in my new book that I'm going to come out. I wrote about it yesterday. I was on a flight to West Virginia, and I had a layover in Cincinnati. And it, I the layover was where I stayed on the same plane. So I didn't even get off the plane. I had to sit on the plane for an hour. And I was talking to the stewardess, and she was from Wisconsin. And she was in her late 40s. And we got talking about which one they wanted to shoot, and then they shot it. And she said, it just, it, it wasn't even right. <laughs> she said it just didn't look like hunting at all. And and uh, she said, so I'm, I'm kind of anti-hunting. I don't agree with that kind of hunting. And I said, you know what? That was probably filled in, filmed in an enclosure or on some ultra-managed property like a lot of these TV guys have now. And I said, that is not in any manner. That's a gross misrepresentation of normal hunting. And that's what people think hunting is, which is that's, sad. That's all you have to go by is what you see on TV. If I were a if I were a person that was on the fence, whether it be a pro or anti hunter, and that's all I had to go by was what I saw TV guys do, I would without question be an anti hunter. Yep. They don't make it even look like it's hunting. You know, they they I'm oh, I'm here for I've been here for a day and a half and I killed I had to work hard for a day and a half and I shot this hundred and sixty inch buck, you know, high five and that is such BS. <laughs> There's no skill set in that whatsoever. You know, these guys that own these big properties and kill these 170, 80 inch deer every year. You know, if you can't do anything against competition, don't tell me how good you are. I don't want to hear it. You know, if you can't do something in a competitive environment, it's totally meaningless to me. If Michael Jordan played against people in wheelchairs, you wouldn't say he's the greatest of all time. <laughs> no, no, absolutely not. If they held a bass fishing contest on a public lake and the top 100 bass fishermen fish, fish this public lake and this other guy that's just a novice fisherman, he got to hunt this dude's farm pond that was stocked with bass behind the barn, you know, and he entered his five biggest bass against the pro guys, you know, he would win without a doubt. He'd probably catch five, five plus pounders because he's fishing a pond that never, ever gets fished. And that's exactly what these hunting guys do. They're fishing property that doesn't get hunted by anybody else. They let these bucks grow until they hit four, five, six years old. And they've been coming by hunt, going by hunters on the property since they were born with no negative consequences until they hit the entertainment value. And then they shoot them and then they think they're big ass hunters. I mean, I just, I don't, I don't get it. Yeah. I don't, I, I don't even understand why they would want to do that. Obviously they're millionaires. Now, some of them. So yeah. they make a lot of money. I don't understand high fence. I guess I do understand the thought process of I want to manage land. I want to have my own place. I want to grow my own deer and I want my kids to be able to hunt it. That I guess I understand, but I, I also don't agree that you should let your kids have a booner for your first deer. Cause then they're not going to want to ever hunt again. <laughs> they're never going to beat it. Like I just, that's dumb to me also. I think freezing your butt off next to a tree with your hand in your crotch because you don't have hand warmers. I think that's what builds character into making you a better hunter. But that's my personal opinion. But no, I, I, I agree to that. To the, the hunting pets part of it where you're no consequences. The deer, he might have seen you, but you didn't shoot him. So, of course, he's not going to care. Like, right. yeah, they might still have the instincts, but it's completely different to a deer that's got deer wounds and, like, shots in them, like the ones you've killed with buckshot in their shoulder or whatever the case is those deer are going to act completely different to any deer that's gone past a, a food plot and uh ate their brassica and then they can go back to sleep because they're not going to get shot yeah they act like deer in a park or in a lake association where there's no negative consequences they see people all the time and they're not afraid of them yeah. and i agree with you right when i when I'm talking about management, I'm talking about ultra micromanaging. I'm talking about the top echelon of TV personalities, yep. TV actors that call themselves hunters. I'm talking about that top echelon that own thousands of own or at least thousands of acres. Don't let anybody else hunt it other than themselves. And maybe their kid or their wives, you know, their wives become 
super hunters as soon as they pick up a weapon or their kids do. You know, they kill 160 inches the first year when they're seven now. Yeah. <laughs> so so that tells you how difficult it is. With the and, and but yeah, as far as just owning your hundred acres or 150 acres and you're managing it because you want to kill big bucks and you want your kids are hunting it. And, you know, you're not managing a herd with that. No, little. you're not. No, you're not me. You're not controlling an entire local deer herd you on a pass, huge amount of pride. I can't pass a deer in New Hampshire. If I see a buck and I want to pass it, I'm taking the opportunity to say, basically, good luck with your funeral. You're probably going to get shot in a month during gun season because right. half the deer aren't going to survive. And that's just something that I have to be OK with. Yeah. Yeah. So, so yeah, you, I mean, you, you have to be pro somewhat management nowadays because there's so much of it going on as far on a small scale, you know, co-ops where guys are, you know, this guy owns 50 and this guy owns 110 and this guy owns 30, you know, and they're all like-minded. They get these co-ops together and, you know, they all say, okay, we're not going to shoot a buck unless it's a three-year-old or it's, got to be 125 inches or you pay a $400 fine or you got to get it mounted, you know? Um, yeah, I, I'm, I'm definitely for that, but what I'm for and is just my own personal opinion, just like anybody else. So yeah. uh, I, I'm definitely into or pro just management. I, when I'm talking about management, I'm talking about enclosures and ultra large pieces of private and leases um that are just large and ultra managed land manipulation uh food plots shed you know shed hunting shacks with heaters um and with no competition that's what i'm talking about and if i got offered the opportunity to hunt a couple hundred acres not the thousands high fence stuff i'm i'm personally going to take it just because of where i'm at and i haven't shot a lot of big bucks but i'll, I'll also understand that it's a hundreds of acres of private land. So I understand that. Um, I know that you say like you would never take the opportunity and you have been given opportunities to shoot. I can't. I can't. Yeah. If somebody just offered me on a regular piece of managed property where, you know, there's, you know, 30 blocks of private parcels and, you know, come on over and hunt, you know, you got a chance of killing a decent three-year-old. Um, I would do it under normal conditions, but because I've kind of built a career for what it's worth, shooting, you know, hunting just public and free knock on doors permissions. Yep. Deer hunting is such an egotistical activity that as soon as I shot a deer on a managed piece of property, everybody's going to say, well, Pete probably shot all his deer. Yep. You just can't. I, I, I've taken that stance and I can't cross that line. Yeah. Would I do it if I weren't in the position I was in? Of course I would. Yeah. You know, where I'm talking, you know, where there's a bunch of people managing little parcels all together. Yeah, I would definitely do that. Yeah. And I would definitely, not that it means anything, but I wouldn't hold that against anybody. And I, 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 ran, just I ran into the issue in Idaho where all these different neighbors gave this one guy permission and he quote unquote leased it and he feeds the deer but then when I asked him he doesn't actually feed them he's going to in the future that kind of sort of thing where he fights off any other hunter that wants to hunt so I got permission from one of the guys um because I, I knocked on his door and and he liked me so he's like yeah you can hunt shoot anything you want and he only owned the field he didn't own any of the timber any of the bedding so I basically had to get the deer while they're funneling through going from bedding area to bedding area so I couldn't hunt where I wanted to. I couldn't hunt a primary scrape area. I couldn't hunt specific bedding. But what I could do is I could hunt the entries and exit points. So it wasn't the kind of hunting that I like to do, but it was what I was dealt. Um, right. And I was in college. I was literally using my buddy's bow this year. Like I didn't have my own bow out there. Um, but really quickly, I'll just say that the guy ended up getting mad that I shot a four-year-old 120 something inch deer because that was one they wanted to get bigger and he had all the properties managed for all the other things and then I I showed the picture to his son when he came out not the person that I had permission from but his neighbor came out and he was all pissed at me and he was like you shot that deer and it's not old enough and we let him get bigger and I was like well what's your biggest deer and it was 140 inches 
And his son goes, that's the biggest deer I've ever seen. I know for a fact if that deer walked under that guy's tree, he would have shot it. <laughs> he would have shot it, and he's full of crap. And I'm going to give him that crap next time I see it. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, that, that's it's pretty like, tough. <laughs> and, then, and then he ruined my relationship with the landowner and started like saying, like, you should never let anybody hunt here, blah, blah, blah. So I'm just like, it's not worth fighting that battle. I'd just rather go into public and away from people but then you have all the other issues that come with public so it's just it was a nightmare there's issues with anything in hunting anymore there's so many people that do it which is a good thing you know and and when i'm on public i get frustrated with other hunters but you, i'm fortunate i live up i live in an area i have a job where i'm associated with deer a lot i see deer a lot um so i'm pretty fortunate you know there's a lot of guys that live in big cities and they work factory jobs and they don't get the opportunities to go hunting like i do and to learn how to hunt like i have yeah. so you know when they get a one week off a year and they go out hunting for that week and they don't really know what they're doing um i i kind of understand that you know they want to be better they just they don't know where to go to get better they don't know what to follow and and because they hunt so rarely you know they're not putting a lot of time and thought into becoming better because they get so little time to hunt i i was i i used to work in a factory so i a lot of little small factories when i was right out of high school so i i understand that every little factory had their gun season and i gun hunted back then they had their own little you know little contest everybody throwing two bucks or five bucks and you know, it was usually a 80 inch two and a half year old eight point yeah. that would um so, but nobody, hardly anybody got to hunt that much. So, yeah, they were just happy to kill anything. And, and you know, I, I understand. Nobody that. could work from home back then. <laughs> That's sure. right. Yes. True. Yeah. I've been very fortunate because I'm a sporting goods rep. And, you know, I, I've uh, been in the industry for so many years and I understand how this industry works, if you will the hypocrisy and the lying that goes on in this industry for manufacturers. <laughs> just well, speaking of manufacturing, I wanted to close on this just so you can get an introduction to your book. Just be, while we close, I've already kept you for an hour and a half. I already feel bad, but <laughs> no, that's okay. Uh, Ask me the name because I don't have a clue. What we're gonna name. Why do you choose saddles over other things for people that don't understand the benefits? I understand them. I've been picked out of a climber visually when I, if I was in a saddle, I wouldn't have. Why do you, why did you make the switch? It was in 1981. So um, I, 48 of my 54 book bucks were shot from a saddle, which is without question more than anybody else in the country. Um, and I, you know, nobody knew what it was. When I bought it in 1981, it was just a, in a poly bag on a, on a peg and it was just a bunch of looks like a big batch of seat belts in a plastic bag rock climbing gear <laughs> yeah and i looked at the header card and it showed a guy up in a tree a stick figure drawing and he it showed a little arrow like he was he could go around the tree and you know and i it was 80 dollars, and i was like you know i kept looking at it i went back in another day nobody in the store knew anything about it they didn't know anything about what it was. Just because it, you know, I could tell it was something that it weighed two pounds and it was something I could hunt every tree for the rest of my life out of this piece of equipment. I didn't have to buy tree stands. I didn't have to worry about freaky tree stands. I didn't have to worry about cumbersome tree stands, walking them in through brush and stuff. I didn't have to worry about people stealing tree stands on public land. Out of a tree stand, you can't shoot 360 degrees around the tree. Uh, you can't move around the tree and hide behind the tree. Keep the tree as a hiding buffer on here. You don't want to shoot. Um, uh, with a with a saddle, you're tethered to the tree 100%. So you can't fall out of the saddle. It's impossible to fall out of the saddle if you're tethered, if you're hunting properly with it. Um, there's just so many advantages of a saddle. You can prep 50 trees and hunt all of them with the same saddle. I'm still hunting out of the same saddle I bought in 1981. Wow. You know, I made modifications to it, and I have a, a Eberhardt Signature saddle that's sold through Tethered that's almost identical to what I'm hunting out of. 
Um, so I would, I would never go back. I, I tend to hunt higher because it, after a lot of people that are afraid of heights, once they start hunting out of the saddle because they, they find out how safe it is and how over weight classed it is, you know, tree stands are very unsafe compared to a saddle. Well, I don't think there's any, I'm sorry. I've fallen out of one. I know how it feels. Out of a tree stand? Yeah, because I was taking it down and it, I, I fell out of it, but that's a long story. Well, everything on a saddle, I think the lightest thing on a saddle is like 6,000 pounds, and that's the rope that you're tethered, tethered to the tree is rated for like 6,000 pounds. So it's way overrated. It's past all of the fall tests, way beyond what any tree stand would do. Tree stands would buckle if they had to go through the same fall tests as a saddle do. Um, I know a 300-pound guy that does a saddle. Oh, yeah, you could... I think you could weigh a ton, half a ton and run out of the saddle. I mean, this stuff, it's a, you know, it's seatbelt fabric for one thing. So, you know, what's the seatbelt rated at? And they don't go bad. The seatbelt in a car that's a 1960 is, will still stop you if you get in an accident. So it's so, the same exact fabric. I haven't used a saddle. My buddy's going to let me try it to see if I want to buy one just because they are a little bit pricey nowadays compared to like, my climber that I already own, but um, I had the question: How is it on your back? Because I have a lot of health issues with my back. Is all the pressure go on your back, your hips, or is it help because your feet? All in your, it's all in your butt. It totally depends on who teaches you how to sit in a saddle. Mm -hmm. If you watch one of my 105 YouTube videos on on I, Eberhard Outdoors is my YouTube channel, yeah. and I probably got plug seven or eight youtube videos on hunting out of the saddle um but how you sit in it is everything a lot of the stuff you see on youtube are guys that have no clue what they're doing in a saddle yeah. um you know guys will stand on a flat front edge leading edge of a platform where their body is like here's the tree here's the tree and their bodies you know their legs are straight and their body's just leaning away from the tree like this and yeah, if, if you're in the tree and your upper body is leaning back like this and the tree's straight here, if, you're if your body is leaning beyond parallel to the tree trunk, it's going to be hard on your lower back. Yeah. Absolutely. It's going to be a strain on your lower back. Just sitting in that position is a strain on your lower back. As long as you're sitting where your upper body is parallel to the tree or leaning forward, like you're sitting in a chair. It's not going to hurt your back whatsoever. I know guys that have bad backs that can't hunt out of tree stands that can hunt out of saddles with mm -hmm. no problems whatsoever. So how you sit in the saddle is everything. And then also most guys that you see on YouTube, they're standing straight up with their legs straight down on the platform or on steps. So they have a lot of weight on their feet. And anytime you have a lot of weight on your feet, it doesn't take long because rubber boots nowadays have pretty soft soles. And your feet feel the pressure after a while. So when you've got 80% of your body weight is on your feet because you're somewhat in a standing position, the bottom of your feet are going to get sore. Do you have knee pads then? You have knee pads, but the way you're supposed to sit in the saddle is you're supposed to have your knees bent at like 45 degrees, you know, just like I'm sitting in a chair. 80% of your weight should be in your butt. There's a seat in the saddle for a reason. It's to sit your ass in. <laughs> that's what the saddle is for you sit your ass in the seat and you have very minimal weight on your feet so your feet should never ever get sore uh so you know properly hunting out of a saddle has a lot to do with how comfortable it is on long term sitting i can sit from an hour and a half four day left till dark no problem and i'm 72 years old have you ever fallen asleep i fall asleep every time i hunt in the morning I fall asleep because I'm always in my tree an hour and a half before daylight. And I yeah. always wrap my arm around the lead and lean forward on the lead and fall asleep till just at the crack of daylight. You never fall into a sound sleep, but you yeah. kind of go. go the the biggest buck I've ever had the ability to poach came in because I was an hour before um, sunrise and he came under my tree stand right past my trail camera. <laughs> I could have shot him, but it would have been illegal. Could you could you make out his body? Oh, I the antler shimmered in the moon. Like oh, it was but I mean, his body. Yeah, yeah. Antlers, shooting him in the antlers ain't gonna do you much good. 
<laughs> oh yeah, no, I I could have shot him if I wanted to. It was light enough. Uh, yeah, I'd have to go underneath me before daylight. That's but that's the purpose of being in the tree that early. Correct. So you're, you're not. Area you're, area you're not. Area. Yeah, you're not spooking yeah. them with your entry. Yeah. Correct. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for jumping on, John. I really appreciate all your all your knowledge, and uh, I'll make sure to watch the saddle videos once I own one or once I'm okay. starting to buy one. Those are the only <laughs> videos I haven't watched because I don't own one. So I'll uh, okay. all sure right. to link all your uh, YouTube. All right, and good luck to everybody out there. Good yeah. Luck this fall. Oh, do you turkey hunt? I do. Okay. Yeah. For about an hour every year. Good luck. For, yeah, that's all it takes sometimes. <laughs> A lot easier than deer hunting, that's for sure. Uh, you know what? As hard as Michigan is for deer, Michigan's an extremely easy state to kill a turkey. Really? Our turkeys don't get pressured anything like they do down in the south. Yeah, the southern states, shit, there's states that have two to four four tags and everybody gets to hunt. Uh, yeah, our, our, our turkeys are pretty easy to kill up here in Michigan. Awesome. Just the opposite of our deer. <laughs> yeah, I wish it was that way, but it makes it uh makes it that more um awesome that it's it's difficult because it's a it's a journey. It's not if it was easy, then it, I don't think it would be as fun. So oh, without a doubt, absolutely, totally agree. Well, I'll let you get back to it. Okay, uh, get it. gonna go work out. Okay, take care. Alrighty, take care. All right, bye bye.